no-nonsense, straightforward work. There is no place for the passive. It demands sweat and grit. But at the end of the day, you look back and see a job well done. James wrote a book about blue-collar faith. It too is straightforward and sometimes hard to swallow. His no-nonsense approach is a direct result of his passion to see the job done. What job? The job of making sure the world meets Jesus. James's personal motto is faith without manual labor is useless. And with this motto, James pushes us until we put our faith to work. Until our faith is a blue collar faith. Woo! All right. Yeah. Good morning. How you guys doing? Everybody doing good? Good, man. I worship. Thank you for leading us in the throne room. I, I, I can't dance, but I felt like doing it, right? <laughs> In my head, I was dancing. Out loud, you don't want to see me out loud in person, but I am so glad you're here. First of all, I want to, uh, online, I'm so glad you're here today. We're finishing our series in the book of James, looking at entitled Blue Collar Faith. Before I go there, today's a big day. Uh, I want to recognize that my wife has stayed with me for 23 years. Today is our anniversary. You, you need to give her a big round of applause. Uh, uh, I know yesterday was Kristen and Brent's anniversary, 17 years, is that right? Yeah, that's awesome. And then uh, we had a, a couple uh, get engaged last night, and so Frank and Andrea, all right. It's a good weekend, right? Good weekend. Still more to come. And so we're finishing our series in the book of James, and uh, I have really enjoyed looking at this book of the Bible. It's one that's dear to me. I really like the book of James. James is hard. But I kind of like that blue-collar edge to him. I mean, he, he kind of says some things that, are, that ruffle me sometimes the wrong way. I'm like, oh, you didn't say that, James. That's a little harsh, right? But James just has such a heart that we see throughout Scripture. We call it blue-collar faith because James is really coming on the scene. He is the first church that in Jerusalem. He's the pastor of the first church in Jerusalem. And his heart is beating because he sees his fellow believers, Stephen, who was at that first church as the first martyr of his faith recorded in Scripture in the book of Acts. He was stoned because he had just really proclaimed the name of Jesus. And, and so James sees that there is bad times coming and there's bad times ahead. As we, as we know that James, uh, James, the book of James is written about A.D. 63, A.D. 64. In A.D. 65, Nero comes to the scene, as we've talked about, and he kind of does an edict through the Roman Empire that Christianity is now outlawed. Christians are, are free to hunt. And it was going to be a brutal time for Christianity. And yet James' heart was like, hey, I, I really want to help these followers and, and really translate for us today because we can, we can see James's heart for us that we'll have a faith that sustains us, a faith that doesn't crumble when life crumbles around us. Been there, right? A faith that, that moves us forward, a faith that works, a faith that makes a difference, a faith that ultimately will change the world. This, this faith these young believers had in the first 30 years past the cross, their faith and their un, nothing that would, not, that would not deter them is the reason that you and me are sitting here today. They kept their faith and God, through their faith, spread the gospel message through the entire world for thousands of years. And now you're sitting here today because of their faith. And James says, let us have a faith that works. James chapter 2, verse 17, is kind of would be the theme of his whole book, in the book as he writes this letter. So you see, faith by itself isn't good enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. He's saying a faith that just, we can talk a good faith sometimes, can't we? I mean, I got all the Christianese, right? I know what I need to say. I know when to, well, you know, some of us go to church long enough. We know when to stand up and sit down. We know what to sing. We know the songs. We know all the verses. We can speak a good faith. But James says a faith that will make a difference, a faith that will be bedrock for you when everything else is sand and shifting is a faith that is put into action, a faith that we live out, a blue-collar, hard-working faith. And James says, that's where he wrote his, his letter. Hey, look, here's what a blue-collar faith. We looked at it over the last five weeks, looking at each chapter. If you missed one, I would encourage you to go online and, and listen to the messages. I believe each of them really pulls out a unique aspect and part of what a blue-collar faith looks like. And, and, I, and for some reason, I'm just going to say this right now. Uh, 
sometimes the Lord puts things in my heart, and I'm going to tell you, young people today, hmm, the Lord's put you in my heart as I'm sitting there. And so if you're old, you're still included, but <laughs> maybe you seek in the young at heart. But my heart is for you today. I believe God's got a word for you. And so you're here today, God wants to speak to you. And so, I don't know why, but that's what the Lord said. And so, James's idea is, let us teach about what a blue-collar faith looks like. A faith that will sustain us. And I think about our young people that as war, our world continues to move forward, hard times are here and hard times are coming. We, but we do not live in fear, do we? We are children of the light. We do not fear the darkness. And yet, we also, in the same sense, need to really drill down and have a faith that sustains us. And whether we're 10 or 90, it is important for us to understand what blue-collar faith. And so if you missed the message, I encourage you to check it out. I would also strongly encourage everyone here to read the book of James for yourself. God speaks to us through his scripture. And when we take time to open his word, whether it's sliding on a, on a screen or actually taking the old school method of actually opening the Bible itself, God will speak to you. He is evident and ready always to speak into your life. It always just takes us a time to sit and be able to receive it. And so this is where we're at today. So we're, James is really at his heart. Hey, how do you have a faith that works, a, a faith that changed the world? And James ends his letter writing to, right? Remember, he's writing to all the Jewish believers in the empire. It's not written to a specific church. He says this, let me sum it up for you. A blue collar faith. In James chapter 5, a blue-collar faith is a faith that believes in the power of prayer. Prayer is an act or expression of a blue-collar faith. You see, prayer in itself is an act of faith. When I pray, I am speaking to existence what I don't see, that God is a present, that he cares for me, and that he's listening. So when I very act of praying, I am speaking out and acting in faith. Hebrews 11, 1. I think we have that scripture reference. It says, faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about things we cannot see. Prayer is how we act on that act of faith. Prayer is confident and hopeful, regardless of my circumstances, that God is listening and can do something about whatever is happening in my life. And so I engage, and James says, look, we must engage in prayer. James chapter 5, we'll jump into verse 13. It's kind of in the things. Are, you, are any of you suffering hardships? <laughs> You're like, wow, I'm glad I came today. I'm like, raise my hand. Anybody here today? Yeah, right? In, interesting in the Greek, this, it, you say, well, I'm not really, my life for the most part is happening, but uh, I was okay. I have been suffering hardship, but the Greek even drills down a little bit farther. The Greek for hardship here is actually a, two, a compound word of internal struggle. Can I say the word anxiety, worry, fear, stress? Anybody want to say that's me? <laughs> we would all say... In fact, there's a survey in March of this year, um, and they did a study and found that in America, anxiety and stress is at an all-time high. Now, for most of us, that's not, that's not news because we're filling in our own lives. And they gave, they, in the survey, they were looking, what were the reasons people were feeling stressed? One was, uh, it was global uncertainty, right? In the UK conflict, it was, I can't believe it's been going on that long, but that was early March, right? It was rising prices of ga- groceries and gas. Can you believe they didn't know what was happening in J- uh, June or May of uh, gas prices, but they were already stressed. Uh, it, was, it was uncertainty of finances, it was uncertainty in the world, and, and anxiety and stress was an all-time high. In the survey, they also found that how people handled them was not healthy. <laughs> Across the board, as they did the survey and asked these people questions, they saw a rise in unhealthy habits that helped keep them or try to deal with the stress. One was they saw an increase of fractured and broken relationships. That stress causes fraction. Maybe you're sitting here today and say, my, my relationship, I see the cracks, and it has a lot to do with the stress and other things in my life. Good news, James is speaking to you and me today. And he's saying, hey, look, I've got the way that you should healthily handle the stress and anxiety that wants to threaten us. Look, let's just be real. There are times in my life, and I'm sure in yours, that stress just seems to come up and almost choke you. 
Ever been there? Where you feel like it comes all around you. You don't even know where to turn. James says, I've got the answer to how to handle the stress and worry, anxiety in your life. What is it, James? James says, pray. You're like, okay, oh, that's good. I was hoping for something a little more dynamic than that. No, no, no. James is convinced the greatest thing we can do as a follower of Jesus in the situations of stress, anxiety, internal conflict is pray. James is convinced the most powerful opportunity we have as a follower of Jesus is to talk to God. The question that you don't have to answer out loud, in fact, I'd rather you not, but internally, do you live that and believe that? See, I'm looking for ways to figure out my stresses. Ever been up at 3 o'clock in the morning and can't go back to sleep because you've got this thing you cannot figure out and it just won't let you go to sleep? Maybe it's you're in the middle of the night. Some of you guys are at the beginning of the night. Some of you guys are all night, right? <laughs> no, I'm not sleeping at all. And what happens is stress is highlighting and trying to put our focus on what we have to do to fix it. i got to figure this out. i got to scheme to make this happen. And it has a lot to do with an uncertain future. What if this happens? What if this happens? How will I handle this? What if this is the outcome? What if, what if, what if? Prayer resets our reality. It reminds us that we are not alone. And that we have a God who is intently interested in your life. Throughout the entire New Testament, he speaks of this idea that God's not a God that's far, that he's near, that he knows the number of hairs on our head, that he understands how we feel. In the book of Hebrews, it says we have a high priest who understands every feeling and infirmity we have. He is close. He knows you. He loves you. And prayer is a practice of putting that faith belief in action. Blue-collar faith at its core is expressed and the confidence that prayer is powerful. It says, if you have suffered any hardship, yep, you should pray. If you are happy, you should sing praises. I think it's great. I think he, I love, there's a couple things we can see in this attachment of these two. First of all, sometimes we need to do both when things are tough. We need to pray, but maybe we should be praising too. Maybe we don't even know how to praise. Maybe we're so overwhelmed by whatever emotionally has happened, just turn some worship music, worship music on and let that just sing and play over you as you hear the worship of praise to God. There's power in that. Yeah. Two, I want to say this. We understand that prayer is a personal thing. I pray. But do we also understand that praise can be a personal thing? It, it should not be in my life and yours that the only time we sing praises to God is on Sunday with the band. We should every day, as much as we pray, we should sing a song of praise to God. Here's the good news. God doesn't care if you're tone deaf. Thank you, Jesus. I don't have to play an instrument. In fact, what's interesting is, in the Greek, if any of you are happy you sing praises, the actual Greek word for sing praises is actually is translated to strum. And I, here's the good news. I don't have to strum like Andrew to still praise, all right? Thank God for that. But we are in a place that we must engage. Here's what both of them are. Here's the summary of these two thoughts. It is relational. It's responsive. There's an interaction going on. Do you see that? When I am sad, I pray. And the idea, I am talking to God. When I am happy, I am singing to God. There is an interaction because at its core, prayer is relational. When Jesus was talking to disciples, the disciples, hey, if you're going to ask anybody how to pray, Jesus would be a good guy to ask, right? Like, hey, Jesus, teach us to pray. They were right on, like, this guy's the expert, let's talk to him. And Jesus says, okay, I'm going to teach you how to pray. Everybody should be like, wow, what is Jesus about ready to say? What is he, how is he going to teach us to pray? Pray like this, our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. Do you notice the first thing he says? Our Father. He could have said, our God, our Lord, our creator, the most high, the God of heaven's armies. But what he, Jesus, teaches us that the heart of prayer is always relational. Our Father. We must understand that because of what Jesus did, what we sang about him dying on a cross for our sins, taking my sin and yours, 
paying for it and rising from the dead and offering us forgiveness, what he offered and, and really is offering us is relationship with God that because of who Jesus is and what he did, I have the right to be in relationship with God, that God wants relationship with me, not based on how good I am, but based on what Jesus did. And when I accept that, I'm brought into a relationship with him. That's why it says that I can walk boldly into the throne room of grace to ask for help in time of need. It is relational. It is a place that I must understand that prayer is not this perfect prayer. Maybe you grew up in a religious tradition that you had to say the right words and you had to do the right moments, movements. And if you didn't say it right, then God was not mad and he wasn't listening. I don't know, maybe you did. Even in my church background, there was this idea that I had to pray a prayer that was like, whoa, that's a prayer. At its core, prayer is nothing more than a conversation with God. It may be just a simple word of help me as, as Peter would cry out on, on the water. It may be a, a litany of things that you're asking for. That's prayer. It is, it is not some kind of rote thing that I have to perform. It is a personal interaction with God talking to him our father what's also interesting in this prayer is not only a, a, a place based in relationship with god it is a celebration and a strengthening of our relationship with each other our father not my father our father some of the most powerful tangible moments i've experienced god's presence is sitting around other people and we're praying together there is something holy when the church or the body of believers come together and pray. This is the purpose of the church. The church isn't a checkbox, right? It's for us to come together to encourage you to be there for each other. As Amanda said in our little shakeup, you need a word of encouragement. You need a word of encouragement. Someone else needs a word of encouragement too. Church is just not about you. It's about the others. Our Father. Prayer is relational. It is best experience when we come together to pray. But prayer is not limited by one style. In fact, James is sharing this part in James 5. He kind of lists all these different ways you can pray. Let's go back to verse 13. Um, it says this, Am you suffering hardship? Pray. So if you're struggling, ask God for help. You pray for yourself. Then verse 15, 14 and 15, Are any of you sick? You should call for the elders of the church to come and pray over you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. Verse 15, such a prayer offered in faith will heal the sick, and the Lord will make you well, and if you have committed any sins, they'll be forgiven. That's a pretty powerful prayer. <laughs> but that is a prayer of saying, asking someone else to come pray over you. You pray for yourself. You ask someone who you believe is in a place of a spiritual authority to pray with you and over you. And then thirdly, verse 16, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other. Now, some church traditions that they confess, I got to confess my sins to forget forgiveness to someone else. I don't have to do that. Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, I confess my sins, he is faithful and just to forgive me of my sins and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. But do you see what the point of when I talk and what's confess? I'm not asking for your forgiveness. I'm saying, hey, here's how I'm struggling. When we are honest with each other and say, look, here is how I'm struggling. Can you pray for me? The Bible says that type of prayer brings healing. There's strength in it. James says... A blue-collar faith believes that the power of prayer can change things. Do we really believe that? Here's how you know. How often do you pray? And when in the sequence of life do you finally pray? Is it the first option? Or the last resort. After you've written down all the options you have and all the ways you can scheme and all this, if I can do this, I can do that, or that person says this, this one, and we realize, well, I should pray about it. And I'm going to be honest with you, I do that, do you? I, I sometimes forget that there's power in prayer. That James says a blue collar faith is a, a faith that prays because prayer has power to change. 
Sometimes we don't believe it because we think, well, you know, there's only those certain people. You know those certain people that pray and like feel like heaven falls down? Y'all been around them? Like they pray and you're like, oh, I just feel like I felt, I think I just felt angels' wings fluttering, right? You know, some people can pray and you're like, whoa, right? Well, surely those are the prayer requests that God listens to, but not mine. I can barely get two words together. I can't remember John 3, 16. I can't remember anything. God's not going to hear my prayer. And James says, no, 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 that's not true. The power of prayer has nothing to do with you. He gives on the verses, verse 17, in case you think only for special people, it says, Elijah, and when he named the name of Elijah among the Jewish followers, they knew who he was. He was a big deal. He was a powerful prophet. When they said his name, they knew he was up there, right? Elijah was human just as we are. And yet when he prayed earnestly, there was no rain would fall. None fell for three and a half years, verse 18. Then when he prayed again, the sky sent down rain and the earth began to yield its crops. He said, look, He's not on a different pedestal. Elijah's just like you and me. He was human. But he believed in the power of prayer. And he put that belief in action. So it's not the level of prayers. Oh, he, that's a good prayer. That's a bad prayer. It's a person that positions himself in a place of faith to pray. Sees God move. I need you to hear that today. What's causing anxiety? What is causing stress? What is the, the turmoil in your life? What do you see? God, I need you to move. I need this answer. I need you to show me here. Pray. Keep praying. It is the act of believing that God hears my prayer, that he wants me to pray. I see him begin to move. Here's another thing. We think, well, I, okay, so anybody can pray, but here's why I don't believe prayer works. You don't know why? This is a real, this is a real one. Because I prayed. I prayed for that one thing, and it didn't happen. Been there? I mean, I really prayed. I prayed for weeks. I cried. I begged with God. I bartered with God. If you do this, God, I'll do that. Ever done that? Yeah. Then you start Rolodexing all your sins you've ever may have committed. <laughs> what am I doing wrong, Lord? Please help me, help me, help me. I don't, maybe you don't, but that's what I do. We think I've got to figure out some way to get God's attention. I've got to do the right formula. And then we stop because God didn't answer the prayer we wanted or it seemed like he was silent. And so we come to the conclusion that God does not care or hear about my prayer or prayer does not work. And James says that is absolutely false. God says that prayer changes things. And it is our responsibility to step into that place of faith. That, uh, that uh, James chapter 5, verse 16. When we look at it in the Greek, you see the verse that says, the earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. What are we going to do with that verse? I'm either going to believe what is the truth of God's word or I'm going to believe my circumstances. How do I lean into believing that to be true? I believe looking at the Greek, James gives some real clarity to what prayer really looks like and how it operates. And this, is the, this is in Greek, that, that last part of that verse 16, written out, little translation of the Greek words, all right? So it says, the righteous prayer, being made effective, much prevails. That is literally Greek word translated that like that, not, not English, made into English NLT translation so we can read it in a normal context. These are the Greek words translated. The righteous prayer. Now, some of us say, well, I'm not righteous. And in fact, actually, none of us are. But well, here's the beauty of the cross and what Jesus did when he rose from the dead. That when we accept him, the Bible says that he gives us his righteousness and he takes our sin. See, I am righteous. Not because of what I've done. Not how many times I've gone to church. Not how many good things I've done. I am righteous because I accepted what Christ did for me. That I began a relationship and un. It doesn't even make sense. It's unfathomable that God takes my broken sin, takes it and says, let me give you my righteousness. Now you're my son and daughter. Now you have the authority with all of heaven's host to walk into my throne and, and, and ask for help in time of need because of what I called you, because of who you are in me. That's the first step. Hey, good news. If you accepted Christ, that's already there. Your righteous prayer. You're already in position to pray. Being made effective. Now, I like this part. Being made effective is literally the Greek word means to energize. It's the idea we get the energy of a, a wire 
coming alive with electricity. Now watch this. There's a passage in Romans 8. Romans 8 is, anybody want to say, great. One of the best books, one of the most chapters you need to read in the Bible. If you ever wonder about who you are and how God loves you and what he's done, read Romans 8. But in Romans 8, he says this, when talking about, and the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we do not even know what God wants us to pray for. Ever been there? I don't even understand what I'm supposed to pray for. I just feel a bunch of fillings, and I don't want to pray the wrong thing, and I, da, da, right? Anybody ever get there? <laughs> We don't know what God wants us to pray, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. That, lie, that wire is being energized as the Holy Spirit speaking on our behalf. It's like if I want this light bulb to go off, I take the cord, which is my position of prayer, and I plug in to the source of power, and it energizes. The cord itself has no power on its own. But when connected to the source, it energizes the cord and the light bulb is lit. This is prayer. Prayer is my position of plugging in and talking to God and seeing the Holy Spirit energize my prayer. And the outcome is always the same. It will turn on the light. Amen? Power. That word the last thing it says, we go back to that area, may, much prevails, much prevails. The word much prevail literally means power. It means to, to, to fight against, to overcome, to prevail. This is what James is saying. Prayer of a righteous person, you and me, in connection with the Holy Spirit's energizing power, produces and overcomes. Do we live that? See, some of us are so defeated by what the enemy has spoken over you, so defeated by the shame and guilt that you have caught on yourself, by your looking at your inability or the times that you did not see God answer the way you thought him to receive, and you've given up and unconnected to the power source. And Paul, James says, look, you want a faith that changes the world? You want a faith that changes your family? You want a faith that sustains you and crumbles around you, pray. Connect to the source, let the Holy Spirit energize you and see him work. He may not answer it the way you want him to answer it. He may not answer it in the timing that he answers it. But there is a promise from God himself that when you pray, he listens, that he hears, and he will do. And he will answer it the way that he sees best. See, I've told, I said this last week. There's many prayers I've prayed when I was younger that I'm glad he never did answer. See, God's not a genie. I just rub the lamp and I get my wishes. It is a relational interaction that I act and communicate with God. That I, as it clearly says throughout the New Testament, that I must ask for things. Well, some people say, well, I, if God's going to do what he's going to do, that, why should I ask? Because God wants us to relate to him. He wants us to share our concerns. He says, you don't have because you've never asked. Ask of me. But here is the key. It all comes in the key of surrender. Not my will, your, yours be done. Let's go back to it. We're almost done. When they asked Jesus, how do you pray? The first thing is, says, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom be done. Thy will be done as it is on earth. As it, as it is on earth, let it be in, as it is in heaven, let it be on earth. That's, uh, that was Blake's mess up of that translation. May your kingdom come, may your will be done as it is in heaven. Jesus taught us that the position that I am in in prayer is a place of asking whatever I need. Asking for grace, peace, direction, hope, deliverance, healing. But it is always combined with a place of not my will, but yours. Jesus then modeled that when he's in the garden of Gethsemane, right before he is about ready to be put to death for our sins and die on the cross, he's praying. And what does he pray? He says he went a little farther and bowed down his faith to the ground praying, my father, again, relational, if it's possible, let this cup of suffering be taken from me. He, he's asking what he feels. He shouldn't ask that. He's Jesus. He's going to die for our sins. He's human too. He asked of his heart's desire. Look, look I, I, if there's another way, I want you to take it from me, please. But then what's he say? Yet, I want your will to be done, not mine. Listen, the responsibility 
of the result of prayer was never in your hands. It's never up to you. Our only responsibility in prayer is to put ourselves in a blue-collar place of saying, I am going to be consistently practicing prayer and connecting to God in my life. And I'm going to release the outcome to Him, whatever it may be. Because I'm confident that God is good, that I'm confident that He is aware, and I'm confident He will answer me what is best for me. See, sometimes... Young people, you're going to ask for things and God's not going to answer them the way you think he wants to answer them. And the temptation like, well, screw you, God. I'm done. If you're not going to do it for me, I'm going to do it myself and I'll just figure out life. And God says, please don't give up. Don't step out of a blue-collar faith. When the going gets tough, the tough get going I step back and drill down in the fact that I know that God says when I pray, the Holy Spirit energizes my prayer and change will happen. Maybe in me or what's around me. Sometimes prayer changes me. Keep praying, I keep praying. Why aren't you answering? God's like, because you're asking the wrong thing. But if I don't stay in prayer, then I miss the opportunity for God to change who I am in this prayer. And other times, I pray and I pray, the light goes off, and things change. You know, a light in a room, how powerful is a light in a dark room? I flip on the light, and immediately my perspective changes, doesn't it? When I flip on the light, I see clarity of where I need to go. And sometimes I flip on the light, hope is not in your house and hope is not in mine, and the roaches scatter. See, a prayer will prevail. It will move the darkness. It will shift your perspective or shift the things in front of you. But we must have a blue-collar faith that isn't resting on just what we know and what we've heard, but what we've lived. And when it gets hard, we grab a hold of prayer and do not let go because we are confident it is in this place of praying that God is going to move. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for this day. Holy Spirit, we all need help. I think about, as I think about these times, I so feel so inadequate to live in that such of a place of faith, Lord. But it reminds me of the man who crawled out when you said, if only you believe, I can heal. And his response was, help my unbelief. God, help all of us today. Give us the strength we need. Help us to understand that faith is not about a mount, but it's a place and a position I put myself. God, help me. Give me faith. The, the faith that will sustain me in hard times. A faith that works. A faith that moves out and makes a difference in our world. A faith that truly changes the world. But right now, as the music plays, I've asked Brennan and Amanda to come up here, and I thought we cannot talk about prayer and not offer a time for people who may want to be prayed over. And so as Brennan, who leads our prayer team, and Amanda, who helps lead Radius, uh, we're gonna, if you raise your hand, they'll come and they would love to pray over you. If you don't, you can share what you want to share, or you can just say, just pray, and they can just lift their hands and pray. Just lift your hands and say, I'd love to have prayer right now, and they'll come to you and pray over you right now. As music plays and as heads are bowed, give us a moment just to have a time of connecting with God. And maybe right now, you can just talk talking to God. Maybe it's been a long time since you've actually talked with Him. Come to him now. Enter into his throne room and talk. Maybe there's somebody else you know that's struggling right now. Pray over them. Pray for them. But as the music plays and you need someone to pray over, you just slip your hand up and they will come and pray with you right now.
Oh, Lord Jesus, thank you for your great love for us. Thank you for taking our place. Thank you for offering us forgiveness and restoration of relationship. God, help us to never underestimate the power of prayer. And I don't know why, but Lord, I pray specifically for the young people in here today. God, may they have a real faith. A faith that's not built on their parents. A faith that's not something they're forced. But they may they get to know you. God, may they begin to begin to talk to you on a regular basis. May they have conversations, share their fears, their frustrations, and their joys. I don't even have a word for it. Holy Spirit, you do right now. I hear the word release. Holy Spirit, release yourself upon these young people. Pray over every relationship in this room, every marriage, every friendship, every family. Holy Spirit, have your way. Pray over people who are in places of fear and stress and anxiety. May they anchor themselves in prayer with you today. Holy Spirit, energize within us your power. Pray for this church. Pray that we are a church that truly points people to you, Jesus. That as we do acts of love and service, that they see you, Lord, and not us. Pray for our city. Lord, I pray for healing. Pray for direction. I pray for guidance. Pray for our nation. Pray that you can unite the divide yes. that men will ultimately surrender their need to you Lord you said in the Old Testament that if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray you will heal their land God may we be a people of prayer praying for our nation just as that beginning in blue the blue collar faith intro God help us to be about the business of the world meeting and seeing you instill in each of us a blue collar faith that moves us forward I pray this in Jesus name amen amen and woo good day and look, there's still picnics to be had. It's been a good weekend already. Um, we've come to the part of our gathering where we can talk about giving, and it's an exciting part of our gathering, believe it or not. You're always scared when money's introduced in church, but around here, we get pretty excited about it because we get to talk about some great things that generosity is generating in our community. This morning, I don't know if you're aware, but at 9.15 every day, uh, every Sunday, before 915, there is a breakfast ministry that serves. Um, we're serving our 50 to 60 people breakfast, and we thank those servers. They're in the 915 gathering. Normally, they come to gathering right after they serve. And so that's part of your generosity that we're able to do that. But let me tell you some other stuff that happened this month. As we talk about graduation, some of those shirts that you gave for prom, were used for graduation. And so we have permission to use this because we wanted you to see people wearing some of those shirts that you donated. So this is a big deal. And in the month of May, I mean, it, it's been a really good month. In the month of May, we also helped a family completely get into a home that were in an apartment. Um, and they were struggling with some things and your generosity did that, you. So I want you to know sometimes we can get bogged down in our day-to-day -day and we think, what am I even doing for the Lord? When you drop money into that offering, lives are changed. 
Your generosity is generating goodness. We thank you for that. We thank you for being a part of Radius. And we feel like this is a good time for you to hear. Invite people. We think this is a church family where people can make a difference. So invite them. Have a happy Memorial Day weekend. And don't forget, upstairs, we're going to be celebrating Brittany and John and their little bundle of joy. So please join us upstairs. Have a good weekend.